Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chapter 3 in the story of Sam Blackwell. In our last video, we learned a lot about his day-to-day -day activities as a senator, saw how he regularly butted heads with corrupt politicians, and learned about someone named T, who he was communicating with to uncover information about a secret bunker project, which we of course know is the White Spring Bunker, where government officials were supposed to go in the event of a nuclear war. We also learned that he was recently divorced, likely the result of the pressure that comes with being married to such a controversial figure, and that he'd been visiting a neurologist, which was a secret he was trying hard to keep. In the biggest twist so far, we also found the reason that Blackwell and his daughter went into hiding. He'd received what he thought was a credible threat from sinister forces within the US government. While those sinister forces clearly did exist, we found evidence at Hornwright Industrial Headquarters that proves that the threat came from them and not from within the government. To find out how this story ends, we'll need to locate Blackwell's bunker. Quinn Carter's notes told us that it's essentially due east from the Berkeley Springs train station, where eventually we'll cross a highway, some marshland, and ultimately look for a cave. As we make our way east, we encounter a variety of threats from raiders to robots to wildlife. As we get closer, we can see that our Pip-Boy compass is pointing out a cave not too far in the distance. We can make our way toward it and notice that something isn't quite right. This isn't just a cave. There are nuclear waste barrels strewn all over the outside behind a damaged fence. We need to take a moment to assess the situation. Clearly, this kind of hazard would keep away most curious explorers, probably hostile wildlife, as well as anyone who might come to threaten the senator or his daughter. This seems like a bit of a risk, but it would certainly keep his hideout hidden. We can take a radex and make our way toward the cave's entrance. Once inside, we'll find even more radioactive waste barrels, but curiously, no radiation. These must have been placed here to scare off intruders without risking exposure for anyone actually living inside. We can do a little bit of looting and then make our way deeper into the cave. As we explore the cave, we'll see that it's now inhabited by death claws. If we're quiet, we can sneak up on them while they sleep, giving us a chance to make the first move. Heading north and looking to our right, we can see a well-lit platform with what looks like an entrance to an elevator. On the ground is a trail of blood leading north and toward another death claw. After dispatching it and ensuring that any other threats have been neutralized, we can return to that blood trail in front of the platform and follow it to the north and east, eventually finding a dead body, dressed in what we might recognize as Enclave scout armor. When we search the corpse, we'll find a hollow tape labeled Operation Summary Blackwell. Commencing op summary, Agent Gray reporting. Blackwell won't be causing any more problems. The bypass holotape got me into the bunker as expected, though a longer range is recommended for future models. Essentially had to play the thing standing on top of the access panel to get it to work. Without the lures to distract those freaks, I might be dead instead of the senator. Once inside, I was briefly halted by Blackwell's laser grid, but resetting the power allowed me to grant myself clearance. Recovery of the access card to our facility was less successful. I found a keypad, but was unable to decipher the code. Recommend sending in a specialist to collect it. I am proceeding to the next target, after which I'll... What happened to the power? The lures! Oh, God. If we had any hopes of finding Sam Blackwell alive and well in his bunker, we can consider them dashed. This Agent Gray, clearly sent by the Enclave, apparently still holding a grudge, managed to infiltrate the bunker and murder him. He used electronic lures to keep the death claws at bay so he could move through the cave to enter, where he used a bypass holotape, which we can find undigested in a nearby death claw nest. 
Unfortunately for Agent Gray, his lures were shut down when he left the bunker, allowing the Death Claws to find him and turn this cavern into his grave. As we approach the elevator, we can see the Gray's blood trails across the platform and is even splattered inside the elevator itself. These Death Claws must be fairly intelligent. They knew that he'd eventually come out, and they were waiting for him. Using the bypass holotape, we can take the elevator down into the bunker and away from this grisly scene. User access updated. Welcome. Taking the elevator down, we can exit, turn around, and look above the button and we see a note titled, Going Outside. On this note, it just looks like a list of reminders, things that one might need when going outside. Hood, bandana, rifle. Once upstairs, head down tunnel to your left, not out front entrance. Always assume you're being watched. They have eyes everywhere. As we explore a bit deeper, we see a bunker that looks a lot like the various Free States bunkers that we found in previous quests, but this one has clearly been turned upside down by Agent Gray while he was in here searching. And then we find another note pinned to the wall, low on food. Low on food? Head to Berkeley Springs, due west from the cave mouth. Run through going outside checklist before leaving. These reminder notes that we're finding give me the impression that either Blackwell or his daughter, who are the only ones living here that we know of, have some sort of memory issues. Was this a symptom of whatever was behind Blackwell's visits to the neurologist? We'll have to keep exploring to find out more. Eventually, we'll make our way into a bathroom where we can see some brain fungus on the walls and, curiously, a sleeping bag on the floor of the shower. This could symbolize something. Uh, it's really hard to say. Maybe, maybe this is just an example of me reading too much into just the way the devs decorated the room, but it seems a bit specific to mean nothing. I can't quite put my finger on it, but it, it strikes me as odd. This appears to be Sam Blackwell's bedroom. And here on the wall, we find two more notes. Head getting fuzzy, mentats. No mentats left. One carrot flower, if the pantry's empty, plenty in mountains to west. Two chunks of brain fungus, grows in cave upstairs, and apparently also in the bathroom. One fire cap mushroom, check the pantry. If you're out, well, you've got a long walk to the forest ahead of you. Distill using Judy's chemistry equipment. Take as soon as it's cooled. Our next note reads, locked out again. Power probably reset overnight. Not your fault, old man. Head upstairs to security room, log into security system terminal, select reset laser grid credentials. Password slipping your mind? Take some Mentats and grab the manual reset steps. Desk upstairs. Turning around, we find another note that was clearly written by Blackwell to himself. Judy, my little girl's dead because of my choices. Don't let Judy's death be in vain. We already knew that Agent Gray killed Blackwell. He didn't mention anything about Judy. Clearly, she was already gone by the time he arrived for Sam. This gives us some devastating context to what we've seen so far. Blackwell's memory was failing. This sounds like Alzheimer's. Judy managed to care for him, providing him with medicine to keep his mind sharp until she died. When did she die? How did she die? How long was Blackwell alone for in this bunker, clearly consumed by guilt? Before we can find out, we'll have to get past Blackwell's laser grid. Incorrect credentials. To do that, we'll need to find Judy's reset instructions. They're by the desk upstairs, just like she said in her note. But as we search for that desk, 
we'll first stumble on Judy Blackwell's former bedroom, which contains her personal terminal. Maybe here we can find some additional insight on what was going on with her father, maybe a different perspective on his controversies, and perhaps we'll learn a little bit about Judy herself and how being effectively confined to an underground bunker affected her own mental state. So here I am, stuck underground with my father. Not the final year of med school plan I had in mind, but when he came to me, he was so adamant that we had to run, that someone was coming for us. Not adamant enough to show me any concrete proof, just that I had to trust him this time, which has been getting harder as he gets worse. But I could tell in his eyes that he'd made his decision, and he's not in any state to be out here on his own. So here I am, me, my father, senator on the lamb, and a pile of books to last us through Judgment Day. Maybe I'll get lucky and he'll come around to us heading back outside in a couple days. Judgment Day. Jesus fucking Christ. While the terminal doesn't offer us specific dates, it's probably fair to say here that that was uh, the day the bombs fell, the day of the Great War. An understandable reaction. Life changes. The plant growth outside has been getting out of control since... since... I can't do this now. Life changes, second try. Okay, again from the top. The plant growth outside has been getting out of control. The main entrance is almost overrun. At this rate, we're gonna have to start burning the roots in order to get out of the elevators. And the animals aren't faring any better. I saw a mosquito the other day the size of a dog. I don't think I've screamed like that since high school. But it's at least given me a new goal in life. I want to never, ever, ever see one of those things feed. Ever. Mentats are key. I've been trying a couple different meds for dad to see what helps keep him lucid. Most effective things so far are, believe it or not, mentats. I always thought they were a party drug for beatniks and armchair philosophers, but they sharpened him right up, which we've been needing of late. He came back the other day covered in mud, claiming he saw a giant bat. That's a new one. I worked out a recipe that seems to get pretty close to the store-bought ones. More scary-looking fungi in there than I like, but at this point, it's better than the alternative. Holy mother of God, I saw a giant bat. Holy mother of God, I saw a giant bat, and it saw me. It followed me back here. Dad was right. We're going to need to be a lot more careful out there from now on. And that confirms what we were beginning to suspect. Blackwell was indeed suffering from a neurological condition, one that sounds a lot like Alzheimer's. While rare in middle-aged adults, which Blackwell would have been, it does happen. Judy, a med student, had figured out how to medicate the condition and keep him lucid, but it sounds like it wasn't totally under control. In the end, it's clear that both Blackwells came face to face with Scorch Beasts, which are responsible, of course, for spreading the Scorch Plague across Appalachia. I wonder, considering that that was Judy's final entry, if that might have been the cause of her death. After we take a minute to process what we just learned, we can proceed deeper into the bunker and find Sam Blackwell's security system manual reset notes. Here's simple instructions. Throw a circuit breaker in the laundry room, open an air flue above the generator, activate a circuit conduit upstairs in the vents. With a nice little note here, all credit goes to Judy and her elusive dream of running multiple hot plates at once. So clearly this was an ongoing issue for them. We'll go ahead and uh, knock out those little tasks. I won't make you watch for uh, the 15 minutes it took me to figure out where all these things were. You can have fun doing that on your own. But once we make it past that and we reset the power, we can make our way back over to the security grid where we can get into Blackwell's office. Access granted. Almost immediately upon entering, we find committee meeting notes on a desk in the corner. 
Hearing before the Senate Committee on Nuclear Energy, 112676, transcript continued, page 384. Senator Clark. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to remind the committee that environmental concerns aside, and I do share those concerns, the uranium deposit in question is in fact the largest in the country, not just the East Coast. Overturning the ban on extraction would help shorten and secure supply lines for a resource our great nation is relying on more and more with each passing day. Senator Blackwell. And I, Mr. Chairman, would again like to bring to the committee's attention the fact that my colleague, Senator Clark, has recently purchased a very large stake in the Atomic Mining Services Corporation, which constitutes a clear conflict of interest. Senator Clark. I will show you a conflict of interest, sir. Committee Chair, will the gentlemen please return to their seats? So there we have more documentation of Blackwell fighting corrupt politicians. In this case, almost literally, which obviously didn't make him many friends. On an overturned file cabinet, we find another note. Back off, Sam. This one on Department of Defense letterhead. Back off, Sam. The decision's been made. The automated silos are being built in Appalachia. We're going to get the same early warning system as everyone else. But if you breathe a word about these timing discrepancies you keep implying exist between the military and civilian warning systems, I'll make sure you spend the rest of your days in jail. You're going to start a panic, Sam. We're not discussing this again. Rand set. This note tells us that Blackwell had upset the Department of Defense with his suspicions that military and government personnel would get an earlier warning about a nuclear attack than the civilian population. While I wasn't able to find any other lore about the system, knowing what we do about the pre-war government, the fact that at least vault Tech and the Enclave seemed to know an attack was imminent, and the fact that the DoD was so angry about this, it's unlikely that Blackwell was wrong. It's easy to see why government personnel would want an earlier warning system. It would make it much easier for them to escape to the White Spring from Virginia and DC without being slowed down by panicking civilians. Knowing what we know about Blackwell, it's also completely easy to understand why he would be upset about that. If we have the Bunker Buster quest active while we're here, we'll find a few additional notes in the Senator's office. The first one, Welcome New Senator, Congressional ID 778232. Welcome Mr. Blackwell to the Senate of the United States of America. Your election to this body is one of the greatest honors an American can receive. Please memorize the ID number above. It will grant you access to some of the many perks members of the Senate enjoy. Checking out items from the Library of Congress, access to the Congressional Gym, discount meals at the Capitol Cafeteria, and more. And please be sure to bring that ID as well as a government-issued photo ID to your first orientation session at the Capitol this January, specific date forthcoming. Here's wishing you a long and honorable tenure in your position as Senator of the Appalachian Territory. The notes we collect during Bunker Buster are primarily there to provide us possible combinations to Blackwell's keypad but they also give us a bit of insight into his life. This one reminds us that though he would later become controversial, as a senator, Blackwell was a very powerful person in the American government. Next, we find a top secret intelligence committee memo provided to Blackwell by his informant, only known as T. It provides a lot more information about the White Spring Bunker Project. Senator... You pulling on the purse strings of this Congressional Bunker Project was exactly the break we needed. The MODIS machine, Vault Tech, members of our own government, they're all a part of it. I've gotten a lot of chatter about the Department of Agriculture having an outsized role in what's going on. Secretary Eckhart is at the heart of this, I guarantee it. But I wouldn't be shocked for a moment if this went all the way to the top. Remember this number, 417604. It's an invoice number for an order placed by the Department of Ag at Eckhart's request, bound for the bunker. They claim it's part of the facility's automation effort. That is a lot. Invoice 417604 is experimental equipment, high-tech, 
Lots of it. The automation thing's just a cover-up. Some of this stuff, this is military-grade equipment, Sam. Biological warfare, human experimentation. They're gearing up to go to war, or more likely, end one. I'm going to keep digging on my end, see where the thread goes, but you might want to make yourself scarce, Sam. No telling how these people will react if they find out we know what they're up to. Based on this, we can tell that Blackwell and T knew that the White Spring Bunker wasn't just some civil defense project. They didn't know the full extent of it. Didn't know, at least Blackwell didn't know, about the Enclave. But they knew that something horrifying was happening. They just needed more information to blow the story wide open. The next note we find is a simple record of Blackwell's divorce from his wife, Emily. It doesn't give us any more insight into the reason they dissolved the marriage, just a date, October 15th, 2077, a week before the bombs fell, and right in time with Blackwell's choice to run to the bunker. Perhaps the divorce played a role in this choice. Maybe he was ashamed or had regrets about the divorce or something that happened in his marriage, and that made it a bit easier for him to make the choice to go into hiding. We can speculate on that, but we just don't know for sure. Making our way back to the eastern wall of the office, we find another note. This one from an oblivious informant, unknowingly providing classified intel on a few strange Department of Agriculture projects. Hey Sam, remember, I'm doing you a favor here, now you owe me, and you've seen what heights my bar tabs can reach. Honestly though, next time you should just talk to the secretary directly. He's a good guy and a smart cookie. I think you two would get along. Jody Soroset, Senate Committee on Agriculture. Department of Agriculture Active Research Projects. Budding Patriots Initiative. A national nutritional initiative to prepare the next generation for national service through enhanced nutrition. Congressional Bunker Food Preservation Initiative. Pilot project to extend the shelf life of various food being prepared for the central congressional bunker. National Water Enhancement Initiative, developing food additives that can be deployed in local water systems to enhance well-being across citizens of the United States, done in conjunction with the Department of Defense. American Crop Protection Initiative, a broad-spectrum look at the use of biological agents to eliminate crop pests. Pest Self-Eradication Initiative, developing techniques to biologically modify weevils, moles, and other pests to self-eliminate. Much of this seems fairly innocuous, but we have to remember that Thomas Eckhart, who led the Department of Agriculture, was also a member of the Enclave and later declared himself president. As such, the Water Enhancement Initiative is likely a reference to future Enclave activities in the American wasteland. We know that in the future of the Fallout timeline, in both Fallout 1 and Fallout 3, the Enclave plans to distribute a variant of the FEV virus through the drinking water to, quote, purify the wasteland, killing off any creatures with even slightly mutated DNA. This note creates the impression that this was something they'd had in the works for quite some time. If we turn around, we can see a skeleton slumped over the desk, holding a pistol. This is what remains of Sam Blackwell after his altercation with Agent Gray. He went down fighting, as one would expect. On the desk, we find a chilling holotape. We're coming for you. I need him. Degenerative neurological conditions. Room 121. 1030 radiation therapy training, lab 206. Near. Family medicine rotation, all tech free clinic. Keeps going like that. Your daughter Judy's a busy woman, senator, but not hard to find. You've been sticking your nose where it doesn't belong, Samuel. And now you've gone too far. We're coming for you. We don't recognize the name Harper Rosiak from any terminal entries or notes we've found so far, but this has to be Daniel Hornwright's previously unidentified fixer. 
the person he paid to scare Sam Blackwell into hiding so that he could get his automation bill passed. It's a terrifying threat, and it all ties into the things we now know. Blackwell had every reason to believe that the government, the Department of Defense, or some other shadowy entity would want him dead. So a holotape like that, with a disguised voice, would be enough to put a scare into anyone. Put all that on top of any guilt he might have had over his divorce and the pressure his family has been under as a result of his activities, one can imagine that a threat against his daughter was just not a chance he would be willing to take. So he took her, they fled here to his bunker, where they lived together for a while until Agent Gray of the Enclave, the actual threat, the actual shadowy force, made his way inside and murdered him. We'll learn everything else there is to learn about Sam Blackwell and his daughter Judy when we examine the terminal on his desk. The first entry is titled, Judy Says I Should Write. Judy says I should write, that recalling things and writing them down will help with my memory until she can find what she needs to brew up some more meds. So I'm writing. When she's not taking care of her dad, she's been glued to the radio upstairs, listening to folks crying for someone to save them, wondering why no one's coming. It's almost like no one listened to that interview at all, like I told her they wouldn't. She's a good soul, which is why I imagine this has been so hard for her, because there's no place for people like that in this world anymore. It sounds like Judy optimistic and young may have encouraged her dad to do that interview with Quinn Carter. The next entry is titled Free States Bunkers, listing the locations of three members of the Free States, which we've likely already found. Niraj and Abby, due north of Thunder Mountain Power. Emma, which is a typo and should read Ella or Ella Ames, east of Thunder Mountain Power. And Raleigh, being Raleigh Clay, southwest of Dyer Chemical. In the next entries, things start to get dire for the Blackwells. The next one is titled, Judy, I'm Sorry. I'm sorry, Judy. Judy went out to collect mushrooms, part of a grand plan for a mushroom and dandy boy apple casserole, which my stomach had been quietly fearing the whole day. But she didn't come back. I cycled through our best foraging spots, only to find her deep in conversation with two men, two men we didn't know, two men who could have recognized her. I waited for them to part ways. If they were agents sent to find us, they clearly weren't good ones. When I got back, I tried to keep calm, to remind her why we have to stay hidden, remind her what telling the truth cost us. I got mad. That made her mad. Now she's upstairs, and I need to get the courage to say what's so damn easy to write. I'm sorry, Judy but with everything that's been taken from us, I'm not about to lose you too. Some kind of bat. I was out hunting today and I swear some kind of bat the size of a core vega came flying over the ridge. It perched and looked right at me, through brush, trees, and 500 yards. It spun right toward me like I'd whipped a stone at its head. Then it howled, howled like a banshee and started flying right at me. I haven't run that fast since high school dodging tree branches and brush. I could hear wings flapping just behind my head and then darkness. Took me a good 15 seconds before I realized I'd fallen into a ditch. The bat screeched and I could hear it clawing at the ground above me for what sounded like an eternity before finally giving up and flying off. When I finally got back and told Judy, she looked me up and down, covered in sweat, dirt and bruises and told me in that perfect Dr. Calm that there's a chance that what I saw, it might have been a side effect of being off my meds. She then turned, walked into the storeroom, and handed me the biggest gun we had. Just take this, too. It sounds like Judy may not have been quite as skeptical about this incident as her own terminal entry implied. Sadly, that light moment will be fleeting. Our next terminal entry is titled, Judy's Gone. Judith Blackwell, 21584, rest in peace. 
buried her up on the crest. This disease. It moved too fast. So fast. One minute she was fine and the next, gone. I recognized it, this disease. At least I think I did. An old memo, maybe? Was this what we were chasing? Had T warned me about this? I wanted to take her to the congressional bunker. They, they could have fixed her. I know it. They would have executed me for treason, but maybe they let her live. But the maps weren't in the spots I thought they were, and by the time I'd found them and built the stretcher, I just watched her die. Chatter on the radio coming from Harper's Ferry gets grimmer every day. Others out there are dying of the same thing, and, and I can't do this on my own. About time I went for a walk. Judy loved going for walks. Don't forget this one, Sam. So this was Judy's fate. After her own encounter with a scorched beast that she mentioned in her terminal, she must have contracted the scorched plague. It sounds like she was one of the lucky ones. It only took her life. It didn't take control of her mind and turn her violent. But Sam, can you imagine being in his position? His daughter, the only person left in his life, dying in front of his eyes, alone in this bunker. He knew the only people that might be able to save her were at the White Spring Bunker. He also knew that bringing her there would be a death sentence for him. But he did what any father would do. He accepted his fate and prepared to trade his life for even the slightest chance at saving hers. But he couldn't find his maps. His condition, his memory issues made him forget where they were, and by the time he found them, it was too late. There he was, alone, memory failing, underground, with the only person left in his life dead in his arms. Can you imagine what he must have felt like in that moment? What he must have felt like in the days and weeks after? We've all felt grief at some point or another, either following the loss of a loved one or maybe even after the end of a relationship. That grief gets better with time, but there's always those fleeting moments that hurt along the way where we start to move on, let other things come to mind, and then suddenly we remember the loss, like a punch to the gut. With Sam's neurological condition, this would likely happen regularly, except in this case, he'd go from completely forgetting about Judy's death to reliving it entirely, over and over again, alone, underground. Maybe this explains the sleeping bag we saw earlier, the one on the floor of the shower. Maybe it doesn't, but it makes sense to me. We know that Sam had a note about Judy's death next to his bed. Maybe sleeping in that sleeping bag let him avoid seeing it. Like a defense mechanism, one subconscious way for him to avoid feeling that pain every time he'd go to bed. Something that we may see reflected in the next terminal entry. I could go on for ages about this part of the Sam Blackwell story. It's the part that hits me the hardest playing on one of my deepest fears and some of my own survivor's guilt when it comes to people I've lost who've suffered from Alzheimer's. Alas, we must progress. Blackwell's next terminal entry is titled, Been a While. Things are going well at Harper's. Everyone either doesn't know who I am or pretends they don't. Raleigh has me working in the armory, cleaning weapons away from people. Good friend, that one came back to get a dose of a dictol for a junkie that wandered in from the mountains. Figured I'd relax here for a bit. Sleep's been harder to come by recently. Having trouble remembering what Judy said I should take to help. She's a good soul, but there's no place for people like that in this world anymore. After some time passed, Blackwell made his way to Harper's Ferry to help the rest of the Free State survivors and probably escape his grief and solitude. Here, he refers to Judy in the present tense. She's a good soul. I get the impression that his memory of her death 
may have faded. Our final entry is titled, They Found Me. Two days ago, was in line for a bowl of soup at Harper's. One of the newcomers wouldn't take his eyes off me. Didn't think I noticed him watching. Thought wrong. That night, I saw him walking outside the barrier. I followed. He was making some kind of recording. I couldn't risk it. Tried to make it look like an animal attack. Messy, imprecise, threw some pieces in the river. Yesterday morning, uproar. People terrified about the attack. Made it too believable, I guess. Last night, heard something fly over the town. Mechanical. Never saw anything. Stealthed, most likely. They're looking for him. For me. As soon as I couldn't hear the sound anymore, took my pack and ran back here. Today, I hung some meat in the cave, try and draw in some local predators. Scare off anyone who might have followed me. Still have months of food in here. Should be safe for now. Don't know what I was thinking leaving this place. Won't be making that mistake again. This tells us how the Enclave finally located Blackwell. They were spying on Harper's Ferry. They eventually recognized him among the people there. After Sam killed the spy who spotted him, they must have sent Agent Gray, a higher ranking, more accomplished operative. We know how that ended. Gray tracked Blackwell to the bunker and encountered the death claws he'd lured inside for defense. Gray set up lures to distract them so he could get inside. Those lures must have been connected to the bunker's power supply. When Gray reset the power to get past the laser grid, as we did, that must have turned off the lures, eventually leading to his own grisly death. As is emblematic of the Enclave and pre-war society as a whole, their own hubris led to their, and in this case his, demise. After searching Blackwell's office, if we're on the Bunker Buster quest, we can enter the date of Judy's death into the keypad on the wall. This gives us access to Blackwell's congressional ID, which in turn gives us access to the White Spring Bunker. Code accepted. We'll find Blackwell's congressional access card and a holotape titled Welcome to the White Spring behind a painting on the wall. Greetings, esteemed congressman or senator. Welcome to the future of the United States government. Welcome to the White Spring. Designed with comfort and safety in mind, the White Spring Bunker, located directly below the lavish resort of the same name, will act as your very own oasis in the event of a hostile nuclear strike. All you need to do is present the enclosed access card upon your arrival, and our automated bunker management mainframe will do the rest, guiding you through the process of getting to know your new home, all while supporting the continuation of the necessary functions of government. So when the inevitable comes, won't you join us at the White Spring? And yes, we will in fact be joining you, or at least investigating what's left of you, at the White Spring. I'm planning two more chapters in this story, epilogues I suppose, where we'll learn more about Agent Gray, and another where, if my theory is correct, we'll identify Blackwell's informant on all things Enclave, the mysterious T. Look for those in the coming weeks. These lore videos, while I love making them, have proven to be more time-consuming than I expected. So while I will absolutely keep making them, they may not come as quickly as I'd hoped. If you like them, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss them when they come out, and so I know that you're waiting for the next installment. To conclude this chapter and the story of Sam and Judy Blackwell, we can make our way up the crest outside the bunker where Blackwell said we'd find Judy's grave. We find it right where he said it would be, with a now weathered plaque. Most of anything that had been inscribed has been worn away, but we see the remains of the date of Judy's death, 584. That weathering is perhaps fitting symbolism for everything we've learned about Senator Sam Blackwell. As much as he impacted the world and set its people to anger, 
as much as we felt the pain that he must have felt after losing his daughter Judy, as much of which, like the writing on this plaque, had likely faded from his mind before he met his own end. In turn, all of this will eventually be forgotten to the world. These big moments, these important pieces of information, these memories of heartbreak, loss, and loneliness, they'll all eventually be lost to time. Hundreds of years into the future of the Fallout timeline, no one knows about Sam Blackwell, aside from maybe some unnamed, unfeatured historians. This is a devastating story, but ultimately, its pain, like the pain of most grief, is fleeting. Time will eventually weather it away. I hope that you've enjoyed learning about the story of Sam Blackwell with me. As I mentioned, I'm planning two epilogue chapters, which you should look for in the coming weeks. After that, I'm planning another deep character dive, this time on a much less sympathetic individual, Thomas Eckhart, the leader of the Appalachian Enclave and self-appointed post-war president of the United States. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you don't want to miss those future installments. As always, if you liked the video, leave a like or a comment, and I'll look forward to seeing you next time.